When night has fallen, when fear is calming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind said I'm not good enough, God, you're enough.
it's your first time at Benita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. For more information on BVCC, check us out on BenitaValley.com or on our social media on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can now follow the service using your smartphone. You can take notes, sign up for events, and give using your phone. Simply go to BenitaValley.com and click on Follow the Service. Collage invites all young adults and 20-somethings to our next event happening this Friday. Collage is all about helping you find your place to connect and grow in a community of friends. Collage meets the second and fourth Friday of the month from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in the Family Center. Every Monday evening, Pastor Jordan hosts a ministry we call Breakthrough Prayer Night. And this Monday is a special prayer night focused on healing and deliverance. If you're looking for a breakthrough in your life, don't miss out on this ministry night with special guest, Pastor Bernard Kiribera from Uganda. It begins at 7 p.m. in the Worship Center. And for parents, free childcare is available. Are you a mom seeking connection, encouragement, and empowerment in this crazy task of motherhood? Moms Connected is an evening group for moms of all ages and stages. We have a place for you to fellowship and grow because we get what it means to be a mom. Meetings are on the second and fourth Mondays of the month in the family room from 7 to 8.15 p.m. For more information and a full schedule, go to bonitavalley.com slash momsconnected. Prime Timers, our ministry to senior adults, happens on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. in the Family Center. There's always great fellowship, a time of worship, and a message from God's Word. The COVID-19 quarantine may have changed some things we do, but it hasn't changed who we are. Bonita Valley is still a connected community, even if we're doing it from a distance by phone, on Zoom, or from behind a mask. We're still a caring community, helping and encouraging each other in creative new ways. And we're still a generous community. Your financial faithfulness continues to make ministry happen, even in these uncertain times. And we couldn't do it without you. Remember, you can give online at BonitaValley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 77977, or by making your gift to BBCC at 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look, an empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, ah! fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. shower. Does somebody want to come use the bathroom while I'm in here? Things mom will never say. 
But the things mom will say and the things we want to say to moms is you are loved and you are valued. And we want you to know how special you are to God and to our family of faith. So all the moms in the room, would you please stand? Moms all over the house and remain standing. All the moms stand up for a moment. Yeah, let's give it up for moms and grandmothers. Now, everyone stand with the moms. We won't let them stand alone. Why don't you stand with them? We're going to pray for moms and grandmothers. And if you're standing with yours, you can take their hand or you can stand beside them. And we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for all the moms. And one of the things we pray for, again, is, is parenting is, is you're practicing. And sometimes we do things right and sometimes it doesn't always go right. And moms can often carry a lot of guilt. And, and listen, nobody does everything perfect. There's only one perfect Heavenly Father and He helps perfect us. But God can work in us and through us and God it uses us. He uses imperfect people all the time to accomplish his perfect will. And we want to pray that over each mom and each family and each grandmother. Uh, and, and we just take a moment and let's just do that together. Father, thank you once again. Moms are incredibly valuable. They have a, a role and a calling you have given them, and I pray your favor and blessing upon them. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them today, and on this day of honoring, may they feel, once again, how valued they are, first from you, as well as from us and from their families. We pray for single moms and single, single parent families and, and, and seeing grandmothers, and we, we just thank you for each and every one. And I ask today that they might be strengthened, that they might be encouraged, that they might feel loved, and most of all, Lord, we give you thanks for them, and we bless them in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. And that means I agree. God bless you. One more time for the moms. You may be seated. Now, mom, we also have a special gift from Anita Valley for you, a tasty gift. Uh, if, you got, if you're on the app, you already know that because we sent a blast out on the app that we have a tasty gift for moms. We have mini bunt cakes for mom. Yeah, they are good. Now, how many of the rest of you caught, I said, mom, they're for mom. Like I saw after the first service, like, like moms, you don't, listen, this is from your past. You don't have to share them. They're for you. I saw, I saw moms out there, and they had kids around them that they didn't even know whose kids they were trying to get their bunk case. So, like, like they had people, so no, it, it's for moms. We want to make sure that every mother gets one first, and then after all the moms get, if there's any left over, then they go to the staff. So, uh, no, no, we'll, we'll make sure we, we, we just kind of walk and, sh and share treats. But we do want to make sure that every mom gets one. And it's just sweets for the sweet. And, and, and know again that bunk cakes at church have no calories if you eat them on campus. <laughs> That's not true. But, it's, it, but, but they're great. So I, I encourage you moms, please get one. Uh, now, on this very special Mother's Day, we're actually continuing the series about identity. We're going to be talking about moms and their identity with a special Mother's Day speaker. And she's actually part of this family of faith, Arlene Pelican. Great speaker, great writer. Yeah, and her family applause. Um, Great speaker, great writer. Uh, she's written a number of books with Gary Chapman. And, and afterwards, in fact, you can buy her books. They're out in the, in the courtyard area. I have her books. I've read her books. Very insightful, very helpful, very practical, very real. Uh, and that's what I appreciate because she doesn't just write as somebody writing two wives or two mothers. She is one. She's both a wife and mother. And so she has a lot to say to us today, a very special word for us. So why don't you give it up? Special thanks to Arlene Pelican as she comes to share with us on this Mother's Day. Thank you, Pastor Welcome Jeff. back. Thank you. I feel like my job is kind of done because that video said it all. It's like, that's what being a mom is like. And so I love to bring you my old pictures. So this is an old picture of Ethan, my oldest, when he was in second grade. It was his birthday, so he was wearing his birthday hat. So usually the thing was he would ride his bike to elementary school with my husband James. Lots of memories riding bike with dad. Not as many memories riding bikes with mom, I will admit that. But one particular day, we were kind of busy. Things couldn't happen normally, so I was going to take him to school in the minivan. So I take him to school in the minivan. And, you know, he was such a little guy with a big backpack. You guys got some of those people, little people with very big backpacks. And he jumped out of the van. He ran about 10 feet. And then he whipped around. And with 
all the classmates, you know, all sorts of people around him, he yelled at the top of his lungs, I love you, Mom! And then not only did he yell, I love you, Mom, there was this thing we did. We were doing sign language, so we were doing I love you, but we did it twice. So it was double love. That's what we called it, double love. So he not only yells, I love you, Mom, but he whips the double love, and he goes, I love you, Mom! Like, <laughs> like a declaration, right, in the school. And I remember just sitting in the minivan and just wanting to cry right then and there, like, I have to remember this moment because when that kid is in middle school, he is not going to turn around and be like, I love you, Mom! You know, I'd be lucky if he was just like, hey, you know, like, something like this. I mean, you, some of you would be happy if your high schooler, like, made eye contact with you. We have established eye contact. So here we were with, I love you, Mom! And I was like, this is the best. This is just the best. And, you know, we have the good old days, right, that we think about, oh, remember when, the good old days. You know, I remember going into a home of someone who all their kids were, you know, grown and gone, and I went into their house, and it was a very strange house. It was so quiet, and there was fresh vacuuming, and there were, like, lines in the carpet because it was so freshly vacuumed. And there were pictures on every surface, cow, you know, every bookshelf on the wall of kids, grandkids. Right? I said, wow, this is a different stage. And I bet that person might be thinking, oh, remember the good old days when the kids were in the house. You know, I remember, remember the good old days when the kids were so young. Here's a picture of my kids when they were younger. And you've seen Lucy with her really big hair. So this is Lucy in the middle. And I'm artificially just still trying to get that hair up, just kind of get that spout. And we all remember the good old days. Some of you remember the good old days before quarantine. And they think, remember the good old days before quarantine when our children actually went to school. <laughs> remember those? And we walked into Costco and they gave us samples and we could eat them right then and there. Remember the good old days? And you know, it's been hard for moms with coronavirus because not only did you feed your children, take care of your children like normal, but now you're kind of educating your children and you're like, whoa, this is a big responsibility with also trying to do my work and it's day in and it's day out. And, but you think, you know, maybe you had an elementary school student and you say, I got this, I can do this. I mean, it's elementary school, how hard could this be? I got this. So they bring home their math problem. You're like, I'm great at math. Elementary school, I'm great at math. But the math problem looks kind of like this. And you're like, okay, 29 plus 17, I got this. 9 plus 7 is 16, carry the 1. 1 plus 2 plus 1 is 46, done. And your kid's like, no, mom, that's not how you do math now. What? There's new math? So you gotta, you gotta pull it out. Well, that, that 29, that represents 20 plus nine, and that 17, that represents 10 plus 17. Then you gotta do the 10, and then you gotta draw the picture, and then you gotta, what? I thought, this is English now, right? <laughs> You're like, the old ways sometimes are a lot easier than the new ways. And as we talk about mom identity today, I think sometimes the new ways we find our identity as moms, they're not as good as the old ways. I think the old ways of what makes a mom special, unique, powerful, influential, they may not really line up with right now. And so we're going to use, you know, some old wisdom and apply it to our current circumstance because many moms today, you know, most moms aren't walking around like, yeah, I'm crushing it. I'm an awesome mom. I'm a great mom. That's not how we're feeling. We feel, oh, I'm not doing enough. I, I'm tired, I don't know what to do with these kids, this iPad is killing me, if I have to talk about the Xbox one more time, I'm going to lose it, you know, like you're in a different place. And with the mom identity, you know, if you've got kids in the home, they don't let you forget. You know your identity, you hear it all day long, mom, 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 mom. Mom, you're like, if someone could please stop saying my name, mom, that would really help me. And they're down here, mom. Mom, oh, I mean, here you are on Mother's Day. It's supposed to be a vacation, but a lot of you still had to work because you had to get your kids here <laughs> to church. And so moms sometimes are looking for a break. Mom, mom, mom. So right now, right here, moms, let us take a break together and let's think how can we reclaim this identity to make it like, yeah, I'm a mom. 
instead of what the culture around us is showing like, oh, you're a mom, that's yeah, kind of second class to being like an awesome executive. Or, oh, you're a mom, my goodness, if you're a young person, don't grow up to be a mom, that's a lot of hard work, right? We want this mom identity to be reclaimed. Like this is an awesome place to be called of God and to, to train up children. I mean, you're raising people. Who else can do that? That's pretty awesome. And so we want to get that mom identity back. So the first, if you're taking notes on the app, our first blank to fill is right here. Moms are measuring the wrong things. We're looking around. We're saying, oh, we didn't, we're not as good of a cook as this person. Oh, I don't take as good of pictures as this person. My kid isn't as smart as this kid. My kid, we're measuring the wrong things. And you know, one thing that has really changed the landscape of motherhood is this thing right here, the phone. Because A, we can be distracted by it, we can escape through it, and B, we can also become very, we compare ourselves, because we look at it and we're like, oh, what's that? And as Pastor Jeff has talked about before, this is someone's highlight reel. When we look at someone's social media page, their Instagram, we're looking at their highlights. And we are measuring that against our everyday world. Look at these statistics for Instagram. In the United States, people, adults, are spending two hours and three minutes on social media. In South America, so this is worldwide, you know, a problem, three hours and 29 minutes. In the Philippines, you guys top it off at the Philippines, three hours and 53 minutes. So... If we're spending so much time online looking at these, then we start thinking, oh, this is what being a successful mom looks like. Because a lot of the moms who have a lot of followers, their Instagram feeds are very glamorous for being a mom. Like, for instance, this one. Here's a picture of this woman. I'm telling you what, this woman is not a mother. This woman is a model, and they just said, please hold this child, and we will take your picture. All right? I'm sorry, but this is not what mothers look like. And so you, we look at an Instagram feed, and we're like, oh, look at, she's so beautiful. She has bliss with her child. But it's not real. It's been all planned. The moment has been planned. It is not authentic. This next picture, story time. I don't know. I've never gone to a monochromatic bed that's ready for a photo shoot and worn my blouse and said, child of mine, let me read to you with my beautiful posing and expression, okay? So this is not real life. So if we're looking at this and we start getting these messages like, oh, I'm such a bad mom. You know, I'm like, get in the bed and I got my sweats on or whatever. You know. It's like, oh, I'm such a bad mom. This is not real. And then, of course, there's the birthday party. The birthday party. It's like, who does this birthday party for the one who, you know, I buy a balloon from the 99 cent store. I put it in the, in the hall and I go, happy birthday. And we're, we're kind of done. But this person, look at this. We got the balloons. We got it's all matching. The boy's so cute and he's all matching. And we look at this and we think, oh, that's what I'm so to do for a child's party? Man, I got to get busy. But we, my friends, these are not the things we have to measure. This is not how you become successful as a mom. This is not where we derive our identity. But so many of us, we're getting caught up in it because we're on social media. We watch all these things. We think, we, we are thinking differently. And one in five adults in America struggle with some kind of anxiety disorder. One in five, that's a very high number. And then one in four teenagers do. And so we're becoming anxious. And I, I've been reading this book by Dr. Gregory Jantz, who, who really is an expert in this. And he talked about the difference between worry and anxiety. I found this helpful. Worry is like over an event. It's very specific. You're worried that, oh, my kid's going to fail their math test. So you're worried about something very specific. It's mental. I'm worried about that. Anxiety is more generalized, and it's more like a physical reaction, like I have stomach aches, I have headaches, I don't feel well, I have a dis-ease, like I just am not feeling well about this, and you can't quite pinpoint what it is, it's just this, so, so many Americans have this anxiety, and I believe a big part of it is we're measuring the wrong things. We're looking at our phones, we're looking, watching TV shows, we're doing these things, and it's, it's not the old-time values that are healthy, but instead it's things that make us anxious. So, today, let's ask some better questions about our mom identity to kind of get us back on the right track. And guess what? These questions aren't just for moms. They're questions that anyone in the room can ask. Question number one, 
How big is God in my life? How big is God in my life? When you have a big God, then your problems seem smaller. But when you have a very small God in your mind, your problems seem big, like God can't handle that. And let's look at Job, Job chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. But as for me, I would seek God. And let's just pause right there. So when something, a challenge happens in your parenting, a challenge happens at work, in your health, right then and there, a lot of times, what did we do? We go to Google, not God. Like, we go there first, right? But here it's saying, what happens when you're faced, I will seek God. How big is your God in your life? How, how much credit do you give him? How much do you lean on him? But so here it's saying, I would seek God. And to God, I would commit my cause. A mom has a lot of good causes. A mom has a cause, God, my son is hooked on pornography. Please help him. God, my daughter's only five, and she's so disobedient. God, help us. God, this, this teacher, we're having problems with them. God, my, my daughter is having problems with a bully. These are all causes. But what does, what does the Bible tell us to do with these causes? Commit these causes to God. I would commit my cause because God, why? He is the one who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. You know, we ladies, we can, think, we can talk for a long time about lots of different things, right? But even if you talked about the goodness of God all the time, you would run out because it's without number. What a big, giant God this is, without number. He gives rain on the earth. He's our provider who sends waters on the fields. He makes things grow. He sets on high those who are lonely, lowly and lonely, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. And so you ask your question, how big is my God? When I struggle, do I see my God as this unsearchable, wise, all-knowing, good, powerful God? Or do I wonder, you know, like, I'm not sure. Like, there's a difference between believing in something, like, I believe that God exists. You know, the Bible says that the, the demons believe that God exists and tremble. So it's not just believing God exists, but believing, trusting, putting my faith in. That he is this big God. You know, this whole idea of without number. When Abraham, when God talked to Abraham and said, you're going to have kids, your descendants, the nation of Israel, they're going to be, you won't even be able to count them. They'll be like the stars in the sky and the little grains of sand. You won't even be able to count them. And you know, when he said that to Abraham, how many children did he have? He didn't even have one grain of sand, not even one star in the sky and nothing. And so sometimes you think, well, God, if you're so big and so powerful, why do I have nothing? And that's where the faith comes in. They say, God, I will believe you. You are a big God, and I will believe that you will move for my family. So I love what Dr. Howard Hendricks says. He says, how big is your God? The size of your God determines the size of everything. And so as parents, we have to ask ourselves, how big is my God? And do my children see that I see my God as a big God? Or do they see that, oh, my God can't take care of this. This problem's too big for him, right? So, man, it makes us as parents grow. Because, like, man, I want to show my faith to my kids. I like how Dr. Richard Ross, he's a professor of student ministry at Southwestern Seminary. He's been working in kids' ministry for decades. And he says, if children are to be dazzled with the greatness of God, parents themselves must be dazzled by it. And so the question, you know, when was the last time we allowed ourselves, gave ourselves time to be dazzled by God, to understand what he's done, to make be great in my life so that I could pass that on to my kids. Look how great God is. I've experienced it myself. It's hard to pass on what we haven't experienced ourselves. So it's a call. Say, God, be bigger in my life. Be bigger in my life. I want more of you in my life so I can pass that on as a parent to my kids. When Ethan was about eight years old, we were playing Yahtzee. And he rolled, got Yahtzee, and we're like, whoa, it was amazing. And then he rolled again, I got another Yahtzee. So instead of double love, it was double Yahtzee, you know. And of course, he won that game. And throughout the evening, he was like, I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I can't get over it. I can't get over it, you know. And once in a while, our kids need to see us, not just roll two Yahtzees, 
But like, wow, look at what God has done. I can't believe it. I can't get over it. Look at this. Look at this child of mine. Look at what God has done. We've got to allow ourselves to be dazzled by God, to thank him, to notice him, to make him bigger in our lives. So how big is God in your life? I got to go to a conference this year. I hadn't been to one because of COVID for over a year. So I got to go to a conference. It was so exciting. I was a speaker, and it was for the D6 Family Conference. And what that stands for is Deuteronomy 6. So it's all about, like, passing faith onto your children. So they're all wearing these T-shirts, right? So the whole staff is wearing these T-shirts. More math, you guys. 1 over 168. So they're all wearing these T-shirts. Well, I'm a speaker, so I don't want to be like, what does that mean? I just want to pretend like I know. Yeah, 168, yeah, it's a good fraction, right? You want to pretend like you, know, like, you're like you know or something. So finally, the second day, I whispered to one of the staff members, hey, what does that t-shirt mean? And then the back says, it's not enough. So I said, what does that t-shirt mean? And he said, oh, I'm so glad you asked. That's why we made the t-shirt, so people would ask. And the average Christian child goes to church one hour per week. And there are 168 hours in the week. So one over 168 is to remind us that the primary disciplers of the child that's not the church, it's the home, it's the mom and dad, it's the parents, it's whoever's with that child at home. So it's a call to like, you know how sometimes we think, well, wait a minute, I went to church every week for my child's entire life. And then they go to college and all of a sudden they don't believe in God? Like what in the world happened? And for us to realize, wait a minute, they went to church one out of 168 hours. So what were the other 167 hours? Hopefully there was some sleeping in there. But with the other hours, you know that as parents, we can't just say, oh, well, the church will take care of it. We've got to say as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, I will show you the way that God is big and I will be a part of that because you're spending time. You're the one that's spending time with your children. 2 Timothy 1.5 says it this way. You know, if Paul had a favorite, I'm wondering if it was Timothy, you know, because he's mentoring Timothy, he's encouraging Timothy. Timothy's going to follow in Paul's footsteps. He calls him my son in the faith. And he says this, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Wouldn't it be awesome if someone says to your child one day, you have the same faith that I saw in your mother and in your grandmother, because her God is big. And we're passing this along. And so the first mom identity statement I want you to walk away with is, I serve a big God. That when you feel overwhelmed in that moment, when you don't know what to do with that prodigal child, when you don't know what to do with that kid that will just not eat what's put in front of them, I serve a big God. It's the first statement. Our second question is this, and it's probably one you've never asked yourself on a Mother's Day, but it's an important one in the day and age we live in. Am I raising a resilient disciple? Am I raising a resilient disciple? You'll see this word resilience, right? You'll see it in business books. You see it in headlines. You see it resilience, the meaning that no matter what happens, Adversity comes, different things come, but resilience is the ability to bend, to adapt, but not break, to be able to bounce back. And for kids, what it means is, wow, I could send my kid to a secular university and they could come out not only believing in Jesus Christ, but even stronger in Jesus Christ. That's a resilient kid, okay? That's a resilient disciple. I want you to have that picture in your mind. So there's this amazing new book, and it's called Resilient, Child Discipleship and the Fearless Future of the Church. It's by Valerie Bell, who is the CEO of Awana. And this isn't just a book only for parents. This is a book for anyone who cares about the future of the church, anyone who cares about the next generation. And what they are asking is, what will the church look like in the year 2050? 30 years from now, these little kids that you're raising, now they're the backbone of the church, right? They're in their 30s, they're serving, they're doing things. What church will they be able to find? What is the church of 2050 going to be like? Pew Reacher Center, you know, helps us to understand that it may not be a very strong church unless we do something now about it to raise resilient disciples. 35 million youth raised in families that call themselves Christians will say that they are not by 2050. 35 million kids 
will walk away and say, that was my parents' faith, but that was not mine. Kids now, they're being discipled less and less by their parents and more and more by what they watch. And what they watch is becoming more and more secular and more and more against the Lord. Now, I want to share this with you, and and I know some of you are going to geek out on this and you think this is really interesting, and others of you will be like, okay, what does this have to do with being a mother and what I'm going to serve for dinner tonight? (laughs) Okay, but George Barna... Um, He's been doing research for so many decades, and they've been working on this worldview, American Worldview Inventory 2021. What do Americans believe? What do Americans believe? And they've been working on this at the Cultural Research Center, Arizona Christian University, and most Americans believe something that most of you have not ever heard of. I know I never heard of it until I started researching this, and it's called MTD. It's Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. It's a relatively new and obscure philosophy of life, but most Americans are adhering to it. Now, I know you weren't thinking today, well, I wonder what MTD is. <laughs> I get that, okay? But as I describe what this belief system is like, you'll start being like, yeah, I see that at school. I see that at the university. I see that in the other kids. I see that in social media. George Barna calls it a watered-down, feel-good, fake Christianity. This term was initially identified by sociologist Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist Denton based on national research with teenagers at the turn of the millennium. It demands little of its adherence, and it dominated teen church culture in the early 2000s. So I want you to see what teens were believing in the early 2000s. That transfers into their adult life, and it changes the, the, the culture and the landscape. So what your kids are going to grow up to believe, that's, that's going to affect the church of 2050. Here's what the beliefs are, and you'll see that they conflict with a lot of biblical teaching. 91% of Americans do not believe that people are born into sin and need to be saved by Jesus Christ. 88% say they get their primary moral guidance from various sources other than the Bible. 76% contend that good people earn a place in heaven through good behavior. 74% believe in karma. 73% say that having some type of religious faith is more important than which faith is embraced. And 71% do not believe that the Bible is the true and reliable communication from God. George Barna laments simply and objectively stated, Christianity in this nation is rotting from the inside out. She may be thinking, Arlene, you're bringing me down, man. This is Mother's Day. We should be eating bunt cake right now. What are you talking about this for? And I'm talking about this because this is real. Like, this is the world that we are living in. And we as parents, we've got to be ready and equipped to help our children be resilient disciples and to be able to to make it through the culture and and be strong. Uh, David Kinnaman, he's the current Barna president. My friend Mark Matlock, they have a book called Faith for Exiles, Five Ways for a New Generation to Follow Jesus in Digital Babylon. And what they talk about is that there are 10% of kids in the church, statistically, that will grow up to be resilient disciples, 10%. So in one way, it should be like, okay, we're doing something wrong because that's not very many, 10%. And in another way, that should be, man, let that be the cry of my heart. Every mother, father, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, may our kid be that 10%. May my child be that 10%. May my child be that Daniel. May my child be that Ruth. That that would be the cry of our hearts. Because a lot of times we as parents, you know, we're, we're not praying for that. We're praying like help them not, help them not to be bullied. Or, and all those are good. But to realize, man, i got to raise a resilient kid. And the reason that a lot of our kids are going sideways is they're being discipled not by us as parents. They're being discipled by their screens by their phones, by their iPads, by their video games, by their YouTube videos. So I want to explain a way that will help you. You'll be able to explain this to your toddler, your teenager, or your 25-year-old may really need this. And it's the idea of digital vegetables and digital candy. All right? Just like in the real world, vegetables 
very good with you. Kind of can't get too many of them. It's like, oh, I've already had my serving of Brussels sprouts. Can't have any more. You know, it's like you never have a problem with that. So in the tech world, there are digital vegetables. These are things like Skyping grandma, doing your math lesson, watching Pastor Jeff's sermons. This is the stuff you can do. Nobody gets in trouble for it. No one wakes up at 3 in the morning to do it. Your, your mother never says to you, put that down, you're learning the Bible again. Okay, those are digital vegetables. But there's digital candy. And your digital candy, of course, those are things like video games and YouTube and Netflix and Disney and all day long. And you just keep going and going and going. And you never have to stop. And it's so much fun. There's a big difference. You know, just in the way in your pantry at your house, if you hear your kid wrestling around and you open the door, they're like, oh, look at me, I'm in the carrot bag again. Ugh. You know, it never happens. Never happens. Your child will never be addicted to vegetables. But they'll get addicted to candy and it'll be very easy. And just like the human body is very unhealthy when it's built on candy, the human brain, the human spirit, the heart, all those things are corrupted when they are built on candy. So we need to teach our kids and even ask the question, hey, digital vegetable or digital candy? Because a little bit of candy is okay, but it's not obviously something you want your kid growing up on. So I have this bag. I like candy. I love candy. So this is my bag of M&Ms. This is mama's bag. It's mama's bag of M&Ms. So if I have this bag of M&Ms and I put it on my desk, and I tell myself, a full-grown adult with self, quote unquote self-control, and I say, I will only have 10 M&Ms a day. Will I succeed? I will not succeed. My daughter, Noelle, was like, Mom, is that your bag? And did you eat that all yourself? And I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> okay, so you can't live that way. And when we say to a child, okay, you know, take my phone, take the iPad, take the device, you can use it, and we expect that they, with their still growing brain, will be able to self-regulate and say, oh yeah, I watch one show, I guess I should walk away and play outside now. No kid is gonna be able to do that. And so we as the parents, guess what we get to do? We get to take away the bag, make it inaccessible, because we understand that's dangerous, that's unhealthy. You know, when you give a child a phone, just picture, you just gave them a belt with a loop for the M&Ms. And all day long, they're going to have to fight that temptation to get that digital hit. And it's not because your kid is bad. It's not because your kid is immoral. It's because this thing has been designed by brain scientists, psychologists, millions and millions, maybe billions of dollars to try to figure out how can this grab your attention. And we have problems with this as adults. So you can only imagine what a 5-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, how are they going to deal with this? So we, my friends, need to be more vigilant to say, if I'm going to disciple my child, I might need to remove that M&M bag from your hip because you're getting other information here. Digital vegetables and digital candy. Now, a lot of times we'll give the phone because we don't want our kids to be left out. Say, oh, if you don't give it to me, I'll be left out. But maybe today it's not so much about fitting in, but it is about standing out or maybe about standing alone. There was a mom named Stacy Philpot, and she was kind of sick of this whole social media thing too. So she decided to take a break from it all. And she got a text from her friend saying, hey, there's a picture posted that I think you're going to want to see. And it was this picture. And it was her son, Hayden, standing at the flagpole alone on See You at the Pole Day. See You at the Pole is a day in September where kids of all schools, Christian school, public school, kindergarten to 12th grade, Will st are called to stand at their flagpole and pray for their school. And so this boy had gone to this flagpole, Hayden, thinking, I'm sure someone else will come. So he stood there waiting, like, I'm sure some other kid will come. And he waited, and he waited, and nobody came. And so he decided, well, if I'm going to be here by myself, and he just prayed, God, use this somehow, me being here by myself. And here's what the mom, Stacy Pilpot, wrote. The toddler who loved Elmo and couldn't go to sleep without holding his VeggieTales characters in his hands had captured the attention of our community by standing alone, by doing everything we'd ever taught him, everything we'd ever hoped he would do. I was completely undone. I read on through the thread. People who professed no faith commended my son for standing up for his. Some folks said, there are clearly still good parents out there. 
Can I pause for a moment and tell you how rarely I feel like a good mom? As someone who battles chronic illness, the sensation of failing is a constant in my life. There's never enough of me to go around. I never feel present enough. There's never a time in which I can offer as much of me to my husband, my children, my community as I long to. And yet, strangers were praising my parenting. So do you. Wherever it is in your life, you stand alone, be it a flagpole or a marriage, a place of work or a seemingly impossible situation. I believe my son would like to remind you God can do big things with your standing alone. Perhaps for now, you are praying until someone else shows up or take notice. God sees, he knows, and he can do big things. Yes, she did so good, didn't she? So don't be afraid if your children stand alone. Only better for them to stand alone and stand up for God. And don't be afraid when you are standing alone. I know there are a lot of single parents out there, so many single parents in this room. One out of four homes in America is led by a single parent. One out of four. And out of those, 85% are led by a single mom with full custody. And so single moms, man, we give you double love because you're doing it twice. So single moms, we give you double love. And you may feel like you are standing alone, but no, God sees you and he wants to applaud you right here and right now. Pastor Jeff last week uh, mentioned my mentor, Pam Farrell, author, and this is another one of her books called The Ten Best Decisions a Single Mom Can Make by, Pam, by her, Pam Farrell, and then her co-author, Peggy Sewell. So I, this is a great book for single moms. All the moms, uh, the books will be referenced in the notes, so you'll be able to see that. Moms, our new identity statement is, I am raising a resilient disciple. I am raising a resilient disciple. This is my mission. And as much as there's, you know, breath in me, I will go towards this mission. So the third question that we can ask today, because that's a bit overwhelming, right? You think, I'm the one that has to raise a resilient disciple? How do I know how to do that? Question number three, who can mentor me? That We look around and we ask a question, who can mentor me? Or if you've already raised your kids and you can come alongside another mom, who can I mentor? You know, I was the girl that did not know a thing about babies before having a baby. I didn't babysit. I didn't work with babies. So when I got my baby, I, I held him like this. I was so scared. I held him like this. I had like two holds. Hi, nice baby and tight baby. Nice baby, tight baby. And I remember my single friend came over to visit me after a few weeks, and she was like, oh, your baby's so cute. I love your baby. Your baby's so fun. I was like, how are you doing all that with my baby? Right? I didn't know. I had to learn, right? And so don't be afraid to ask for help. The help is there. And the church is really the place where generations can come together, where there can be community and you can find help. And so we look at Psalm 145 for one generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. We need each other from all the generations to tell one another, to tell our kids and our grandkids, this is the mightiness of God. This is the God we serve. Psalm 148, 12 and 13 says it this way, young men and women, old men and children, let them Praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. You know, you don't have to be a parent to make an imprint in a child's life. That you may be the volunteer in kids' church that can really speak to someone and really help them and change the trajectory of a child's life. You know, in March 2015, Harvard Center on the Developing Child released a study that stated this. Every child who winds up doing well has at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive adult. So you don't have to be a parent to be that supportive adult. That every kid needs one caring, supportive adult that's like, I love you, you can do this, you got this. And kids who have that presence, they do well. What if you're the one looking for a mentor? I need someone to look at me. And someone to say to me, you can do this, right? And you search this person out. Proverbs 2, 4 and 5 says, and if you look for it, wisdom, as for silver, and search for it as hidden treasure. There's effort. It's not just going to drop in your lap, this wisdom. But God says, if you seek for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. James tells us, if you seek wisdom, 
you will find it. And you know, you can seek that wisdom in a mom, in a grandma, aunt, uncle, former teacher. You can seek that wisdom from someone sitting in this room. And I would suggest that you don't say, hey, could we do a mentoring program for the next 10 years once a week? That might be a little bit, you know, kind of like, whoa, I can't do that. But you could certainly ask him for coffee. You go, hey, could I have coffee with you? And just see what happens. But start somewhere to look for that mentor in your life. I have found so much information through books, through podcasts. Um, my book Screen Kids and Grandparenting Screen Kids, if you're just like, oh my word, what do we do with all this technology in the house? These books came out in the fall, so they have the latest research in them. So grab these on your way out for yourself, for your children, and have your mom identity statement be this. I will seek wisdom. When I don't know what to do, I will seek wisdom. You know, one of the greatest joys as an author um, for me has been writing with Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote, who, you know, is the creator of the five love languages, which many of you know. And I have this Happy Home podcast. You can find it anywhere you see your podcast, Happy Home podcast. And I'm going to show you, I got to interview Dr. Chapman, so I'm going to show you a clip, you know, that's never been seen before that we published later. But listen to what Dr. Chapman has to say about his growing up years. I think it was after college, and you yes. were at your summer camp serving at the Navigators, and God spoke to you. And I believe that in that moment, it, it set the trajectory for how your life would be. Share that story. It's such a beautiful one. Yeah, it's one of the, it's one of the biggest things that ever happened in my life. I think you're right. I had finished college. I went to Moody Bible Institute, which was at that time only a three-year school. So I went to Wheaton College and got my degree. And as a college graduate, you know, I kind of had the idea I can do it. Just turn me yeah. loose now, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can take on the world. That's right. And I went to the summer training program of the Navigators in Colorado Springs. And uh, the, plan, the program involved an eight-hour job every day on, on the, at the headquarters. And then we had a, a weekly Bible study group, and we had a, a mentor that we met with every week. And then we could attend the conference sessions. So they assigned me to work in the print shop. And the first day... They assigned me to a, a, a what they call a folding machine. It takes huge pieces of paper, folds them down into you know small sizes, and so they explained to me how it operated. And you got to get the pressure right on all the rollers and all this stuff. And I thought, okay, yeah, I can, I can do it. Okay. So all that day I worked, you know, trying to get it to work, and I, I couldn't get it to work. I mean, it, it just now it came out crooked, and I was just wasting paper. Well, the next morning they gave me another instruction time, and I thought, okay, I think I got it. I think I got it this time. And I worked all day, and I couldn't get it to work. Well, this went on. That was Monday and Tuesday. It went on to Thursday. Or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Friday morning, four days, I couldn't get it to work. I spent eight hours a day working on it. Friday morning, I was having my quiet time on a, on a huge stone in the middle of a, a dry moat. Uh, and, and I came to John 15, verse 5, where Jesus said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. You stay connected to me. You'll bear much fruit, but without me, you can do nothing. And I wept. I just broke down and wept. And I said, oh, God, I can't even run a dumb folder without you. And I wept some more. <laughs> and I said, I'm asking you to give me the ability to run that folder. And I went in that day, and that folder just went like that. All summer long, I read that folder. <laughs> but again, as you said, it, it is one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, that without God, I can do nothing. I love that, Dr. Isn't that so good? I love that Dr. Chapman learned that lesson early in his life. You know, here he is, college age, learning that lesson, apart from you, I can do nothing. And that lesson was learned, you know, while he was away. He wasn't looking at his cell phone when he was sitting on his moat and praying to God. And our kids need, our teenagers need those moments away from their technology for God, to seek God. So this is our prayer. God, give my child, my grandchild, an experience with you that will be so profound and life-changing that they'll never forget it. And this is the prayer for us as moms, like, I can't even do the dumb folder, you know, like, I can't even do the laundry right. I could burn the meal. I did it all wrong. Like, Lord, and we just say, Lord, apart from you, I can do nothing. Will you please help me to raise these children? 
and God will answer that prayer. And what a relief that our mom identity isn't on us. We're just the branches. Our mom identity is in the vine. Like my mom identity is in God, and God is strong and big. So I can do this as a mom because my identity is there. And so uh, when Lucy was seven, when she was younger, she would say all these like really cute little things. This is a picture of her when she was seven, our dog Winston, who is now an enormous, but this is when he was a puppy too. And she said, Mom, I only remember things that are worth remembering. I was like, hey, that's good advice. I only remember things that are worth remembering. And you know what, as moms, we don't have to remember all our mistakes. Sure, we can remember them to learn from them, but then we can let them go. Maybe they're grudges that we've been holding with our, for our, against our mom or grandma for years and years and years, our aunt, that we need to say, you know what, I'm just going to remember the things that are worth remembering. Maybe it's a day of reconciliation. Remember the things that are worth remembering. Don't remember that your mom identity has to be in your Instagram followers or how picture perfect your birthday party is or if your kids have straight A's. Don't worry about, it. don't remember those things. But instead, ask these three questions. How big is God in my life? Am I raising a resilient disciple? And who can mentor me in this journey? Or who can I mentor? So that when we leave this wonderful place of worship, we can say, I serve a big God. And I am raising a resilient disciple. And I will seek wisdom. Because you know what? It's not just the good old days. It's not just looking backward and saying, oh, remember the good old days. But right now, the season you're in, this is a good time too. They're the good now days. And here's a picture of my kids now in the good now days. You know, they're a lot bigger now. And I know people that, oh, teenagers, what a headache. But you know, I love my teenagers. I think, man, these are the good now days. And we have to appreciate the season of life we're in now. To not just think of the good old days, but to remember the good now days. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. You know, a few weeks ago, I was helping out in kids' church, and a little girl was teaching me how to hula hoop. See, it's never too late. So <laughs> she was teaching me how to hula hoop, and she asked me, or I asked her, what grade are you in? And she told me, and then she looked at me, and she said, what grade are you in? <laughs> And I was like, oh, honey, I, I'm not in a grade anymore. I, I will have lost that a long time ago. But then I went home later and I thought, that was a very clever question. What grade am I in? Because you know what? We never stop learning. You can be an 80-year-old mom and there's still something to learn. What grade are you in? Dr. Howard Hendricks said, a good leader has a compass in their head and a magnet in their heart. And I would insert a mom there. A mom, a good mom, has a compass in their head. Man, my God is big. I'm raising this, you know, resilient disciple. And I'm going to seek out wisdom and find mentors. Compass in their head and a magnet in their heart. So there's nothing quite like the love of a mother. In my book, 31 Days to Becoming a Happy Mom, I interviewed um, lots of moms to find out what made them tick. And here's what my daughter, Noelle, said many years ago that I put in the book. Noelle loves to shower me with kisses and hugs whenever I'm just leaving for the grocery store or saying goodnight. I don't ever want to let go, she'll exclaim. It's inevitable that one day Noelle will let go, but I can always hold on to her in my heart. After all, I will always be her mother. And you know what? No matter how old your kids get, you are always going to be their mother. And that, my friends, is not a second-class citizen spot. That is a high honor and a high calling. May God bless you on this Mother's Day. Thank you. Uh, one more time, would you show Arlene your appreciation? Great Mother's Day work. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to have a closing prayer together. Uh, great, great challenge, insights, encouragement, uh, not just for moms, really for all of us. Uh, once again, I want to just uh, take a moment and I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes just for a moment to shut other things out that you and I might open the eyes of our hearts and that God would open the eyes of our understanding, first and foremost, to know how much we need Him, that apart from Him, we can do nothing. We actually will accomplish nothing that will last apart from God in us. And if you've never asked Jesus to be the Savior and leader of your life, I encourage you to make that choice today. 
It's not just about emotion. It's not about feeling something. The Bible word for, for repent means to change your mind. It's a change of mental direction. I need God. And how do I connect with God? Right where you stand, wherever you're watching, online, at whatever time it might be, to simply say, God, forgive me of my sin. My sin is choosing me over you, my way over your way, trying to be God of my own life. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for suffering for my sin, paying the price for my sin, that I might be a child of God. And I receive you, and I accept you. I choose you as you have chosen me. In Jesus' name, amen.